Okay, we're going to get started with the next panel. If you, you could take a seat and we're going to move on. Um, the second panel, I'm pleased to introduce the moderator of the second panel, uh, my colleague at the Center for Energy and Sustainable Development, Josh Frechet. He's our Associate Dean for Research and Development. And as with the previous panel, we'll be circulating three by five cards. And if you have any questions of any of the panelists, then we'll, gra we'll gather those cards and, and present them to Josh, and then he'll, he'll be able to serve the moderator and, and try to keep the uh, combine those questions so, so when we get to the question and answer period of the panel. So I'll turn it over to Professor Frechet. Well, thank you, Jamie, and uh, thank you everyone for being here. Uh, we're glad to have you at WVU College of Law. Uh, I am Josh Frechet. I'm a professor here uh, at the college. I teach and conduct research as part of the Center for Energy and Sustainable Development. Uh, I'm also part of the uh, WVU Center for Innovation in Gas Research and Utilization, which is an interdisciplinary group based in the Statler College of Engineering, uh, which conducts research directed at innovative pathways uh, for shale gas utilization with the goal of maximizing benefit to the region. Uh, I'm happy to be part of this panel today. It's an important one uh, called Minimizing the Environmental Impact of Energy Production and Distribution. Natural resources are a critical part of West Virginia's economy, and minimizing the environmental impacts related to resource extraction is not only important for our health and safety, it's critical for our economy. We have learned in a variety of settings, most notably the Deepwater Horizon uh, well disaster in the Gulf of Mexico, that environmental disasters are also economic disasters. Uh, I'm thrilled to introduce you to our esteemed panel today, uh, who will share with us ways to minimize environmental impacts while engaging in sustainable practices that can support development in the state and our region. Uh, our first speaker is Todd Miller, who works with landowners, watershed associations, agency partners, mitigation banks, and private clients to restore natural functions in watershed streams and wetlands and to decrease risks to people from stream bank erosions, flooding, and other similar issues. He and his team assess and prioritize uh, res restoration sites, develop new restoration plans, uh, and manage on-the-ground projects. Todd worked in the Peace Corps and has a background in community planning, both of which prepared him for his work with communities and agencies seeking to restore our streams and watersheds. Next, Angie Rosser uh, will speak to us. She joined the West Virginia Rivers Coalition as executive director in 2012 to continue her work on social justice issues in the nonprofit sector in West Virginia. She engages in clean water advocacy to protect access to clean water and to ensure conservation of the region's water resources. Angie's a co-chair of the National Wildlife Federation's Water Caucus and is the current co-chair of the Choose Clean Water Coalition, which works to protect and restore the Chesapeake Bay watershed. Earlier this year, she was recognized by River Network as uh, their national river hero uh, and, and earned that award. She is also uh, happens to hold a master's degree in organizational communication from WVU. And finally, Susan Packard Legro is the president and executive director of the Center for Responsible Shale Development and has extensive experience in energy, environmental, and natural resources law across multiple in, uh, industries and applications. Prior to joining the center, she was a high-level attorney in private practice, serving clients on a variety of uh, issues in energy and environmental uh, matters, including representation at state and federal agencies, as well as project development and finance. She began her career as an attorney for the US EPA and went on to work as in-house counsel at several large international corporations before entering private practice. Uh, each speaker is going to have about 20 minutes, and then we'll have time for questions at the end uh, of their presentations. And with that, uh, welcome Todd Miller. Okay. Well, good morning, everybody. It sure is great to be here. It's, it's just been a great conference so far. I've really enjoyed meeting all the people I've met, enlightening conversations. Uh, I don't usually get to hang out in an energy crowd, so I'm, I'm learning a lot. Um, so I work for Canaan Valley Institute. We're a small nonprofit up in Tucker County, West Virginia, and we serve um, the state of West Virginia as well as uh, Western Maryland, Western Virginia. Um, and uh, have worked in the past in Pennsylvania, too. Um, we work in multiple areas. I manage our stream restoration team. And so I'm going to be talking today about uh, impacts we've seen from coal mine sites, not because coal mines are all we do, um, but because we've had to work on some and we've learned some things on the way. Uh, so I'm going to talk about 
three sites. Uh, one is a, um, a site uh, uh, Thomas referred to in his presentation. It's the Mauer Tract. It's up on Cheap Mountain uh, in the Monongahela National Forest, elevations from three to 4,000 feet roughly. Um, and this was mined in the 80s before the Forest Service uh, acquired it. Um, so it's, it's post smacra mining. Uh, it was left very stable. It actually won awards for the quality of reclamation that, that, that happened there. And indeed, it is very stable. Uh, the problem is that it's in a state of uh, arrested ecological succession. We've got these uh, fields of grass on compacted soils. We've got uh, exotic trees there that are pretty stunted, not growing very well. Uh, ecologically speaking, it's really not what it should be. And what it should be is a red spruce forest that looks kind of like this. This is a young red spruce forest. Um, but it's, um, it's not like that right now. Um, red spruce has many, many benefits, um, especially carbon sequestration. It's, it's one of the forest types that actually sequesters more carbon underground than, uh, than above ground. Um, the acid soil has a, has a role in that. Uh, so on the Maurer Tract, w uh, there's been um, many efforts over the, since about 2010 to uh, restore the forest ecosystem there. Um, it started with just trying to plant trees, and that completely failed. The soil was just too compacted. Those trees didn't, didn't last a year. And so the Forest Service learned they had to deep rip the soils, decompact them. So they have um, big dozers with big shanks on the back of them that they pull that literally just rips up the soil. They do it in kind of a grid pattern and just uh, totally makes a big uh, giant mess. But it prepares the place uh, for reforestation and, and tree planting with uh, little native red spruce and other high elevation species uh, to, to get this elevation, this, this uh, ecosystem going again. Uh, they've also uh, torn out a lot of the exotic pines that were stunted. Um, they are not growing very well, not reproducing, and it actually there's some benefits to having some organic matter uh, on the ground released slowly. Uh, so one of the other uh, issues we were brought in to deal with was uh, road runoff. And um, th so this is a picture uh, starting at the bottom, uh, the bottom left there. Uh, we found this stream that needed restoration. We thought it was a stream, and we walked up it and turned a few corners, and we realized <coughs> it was a road. This was an old road that had just completely blown out from runoff uh, accumulating higher in the watershed. Um, and so here's, here's a, a LIDAR image of the road network that was up in this place. And you can see how one road sort of uh, may intercept groundwater and, and capture surface water and direct it into another road and another road, and it sort of funnels down to places in the bottom uh, where you get steep gullies going right, right down the slope. Uh, so we were brought in to do road decommissioning, which is... Uh, taking uh, big excavators and uh, decompacting and outsloping the surface, uh, planting uh, native seed and uh, red spruce uh, as we go. And so what this does is it, uh, it takes these eroding gullies and it pretty much does away with the surface water. It puts that water uh, back underground uh, where it uh, can absorb uh, into groundwater and get released much more slowly uh, as, as cool spring water, which is much better for the watershed, for stability, for brook trout, for, for many things. Made a lot of progress over the years. Phase one, phase two, they're starting phase three. I wanted to recognize Appalachian uh, Stewardship Foundation as being one of, one of the key funders up there. There have been many, many partners involved over the years, and so it's, um, it's, it's a pretty big effort. I want to shift gears to a, a pre-smacra pre site um, in Logan County, West Virginia. We worked with a mitigation bank to find uh, places down there we could fix. 
for mitigation under the Clean Water Act, places we could restore streams. And it was kind of a, a difficult process to find something we could actually fix. So one of the sweet spots we found was uh, sort of older coal mining, where the scale of operations was still small enough that we could sort of put things back together again, uh, at least in, in little bits. Um, so if you can see the colors on that topo map, there's uh, the watershed we worked in is outlined in yellow there, and there's sort of a, a gray ring around the inside of it that's an old mine bench. And that bench, um, so it's, it's, a, it's an old high wall mine, and what you had was streams coming off the high wall into gullies onto the bench, and then diverted any which way but where the streams used to take their water, which is down into the valley bottoms below. Um, and so uh, lots of stream restoration potential there. We also had roads intercepting drainages, gas well pads to deal with, and um, some exotic vegetation that had been brought in. So here's a picture. Um, the upper left picture is of the top of the high wall where the stream kind of pours off um, its net natural bed down into a, a steep, steep gully down onto the bench. And you can see the water pooled up there on the bench. Um, and from where it's pooled, then it goes to, it runs down the bench, not to the middle of the valley where there's a stream bed for it that's now left dry, but it finds a low spot, uh, which is the middle picture, and then it gullies down from there uh, into the valley bottom in a new channel. So meanwhile, it's taking all that uh, loose fill material and depositing it in the stream valley below, which is, which is not good for, for critters or stream functions or, or other things. Um, the top is, an, is a digital elevation model of what this bench looks like in one of the valleys we worked on. Um, it shows uh, a, a valley coming in from the top and several valleys coming in from the side and how they hit that bench. And you can sort of imagine how those benches are sort of tilted back into the slope. So the water accumulates along the, the back toe of that slope and, and runs, like I say, every, every way but down into the valley below where it should go. Uh, the bottom image is a um, sort of a, a cut fill model of how to rebuild that valley to get a stream that goes down from the, down into the valley below again, where it should go, reconnecting the plumbing of the watershed. Um, so this is a, a picture of the streams once built. Um, we use lots of wood uh, in the channel. There's, there's many benefits of that. Um, but but they're, they're built to be stable over time, but to, to reconnect the, the flow from above, the, above that mine bench to down below to back into the main stem stream on the valley bottom. So down below the bench, there were also some, some pretty big gullies that were left over. Um, when things aren't left in a stable state, they, they tend to get worse over time, and that's certainly what happened here. Uh, this gully would have kept eroding for I don't know how many more years until it, it, it would probably be self-consuming for a long, long time, the way those steep side slopes were. You can see f trees trying to grow up but keep falling down into it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so we designed um, this, which is pulling some of that loose fill out, using it elsewhere, uh, stabilizing slopes and, and building a stable pool with natural... Uh, uh, a stable stream with natural steps and pools running through there, dissipating energy, transporting organic materials. Um, they're all full of fish now. It's acting like a stream again. Here was a site with a, um, a gas well pad on the um, upper left there. That white thing is, is um, sort of an old gas well. This actually, uh, this gas, uh, we tried to decommission these these little gas wells, but it feeds a nearby um, shopping area directly. Uh, so it was, it was in use, in demand, and, and we couldn't do that. So we had to work around them as best we could, and so that meant sort of reshaping little valleys and stream channels around these gas wells and roads and pulling out this, this old failing culvert and 
rebuilding a stabilized uh, stream crossing there uh, that the, the gas folks could get over, but uh, so could the fish. I mentioned before we use wood in a lot of our restoration work. If you, if you go up a natural stream channel in the forest, that's, that's what's in there. There's rocks and boulders and things forming uh, the pattern of the channel, but there's also a lot of wood. It captures sediment, it captures leaf pack, it gets the uh, macroinvertebrates growing. Um, it, it's, it's pretty important. Um, so uh, the map here, those red spaghetti lines all over, is the road network in this place. That's a 700-acre watershed, and there's a, there was about 25 linear miles of roads in there all over the place. Some of them were left over from um, coal mining. Some of them were from more recent uh, timber jobs. Uh, but um, you, can, you can see how they would affect drainage patterns. And so this image on the, uh, on the left, um, if you can see, there's uh, faint yellow lines go, going up into some of those valleys. Those are streams that are not there but we think should be there based on drainage area and slope, et cetera. And you can see how the road network around them is probably funneling a lot of water away from those little stream valleys, just redirecting flow. Um, so uh, this was one of the first projects uh, in West Virginia and maybe, maybe across a bigger region where we actually got mitigation banking credits to decommission roads to restore streams, which is, which is pretty cool. Something we learned from the Forest Service that is now uh, part, of, part, of road, part of mitigation banking practice. Here's a picture of the road decommissioning there, outsloping, decompacting. Um, one of the other problems we've had on the site that we didn't know we've, we would have to this extent is exotic vegetation. So all those streams have native uh, trees and, and shrubs and herbaceous plants planted along them. We have to monitor those for, for 10 years as part of this mitigation bank uh, for credit releases. And within one year, some of these plots got completely overtaken in exotic vegetation. This is um, Lespedeza, Chinese Lespedeza, and it has taken off like mad. I had a list of exotic plants at this site and this wasn't even on my list. There's only three or four of those around if you, if, you, if you drive around the watershed, but it was in the seed bank, and when we stirred all that up to restore these sites, we just released those seeds, and they're growing like crazy. So I've been crawling around in there trying to count trees under that stuff. It's about knee high, and I, I don't know what we're gonna do. But this was, this was an, uh, a legacy a plant that was in there to stabilize soils from, from the mining days, and, it was kind of on the decline, but um, it's, it's not anymore. <laughs> the third site that uh, I wanted to highlight is a, a mountaintop mine site, um, so more modern mining. This is in, in Logan County. You can see the, uh, we were actually working on a project in the valley below, in that wooded area down below the, the mined mountaintops. Uh, but we started to follow the gullies that we saw that we were trying to fix upstream. And, that, and so we had to get on the mountaintop mine to see what was going on. Um, and, and so what we saw was there is a series of um, constructed, constructed ditches like this here uh, that, uh, that lead to an NPDES outlet where the, where the mine has to monitor their water quality of their, of their outfall from their whole stormwater management system up there. And um, the way the road system works around those mountaintops is there's ditches along all of them, and they take water from one area and move it to another area and drop water down these stabilized ditches into little stream valleys below, but those are stream valleys that are not always sized are not built by Mother Nature um, to contain the flows that come uh, from, these, from, from these, this big bare area uphill. Um, so here's some pictures up above is uh, 
the upper right corner there, upper left from your angle is looking at one of the roadside ditches and then the sort of stabilized rock ditch that takes it downstream. And then uh, the bottom pictures are where that rock channel ends at the mine permit boundary. And it's just totally blown out. It, it was a little channel. It wasn't, uh, nature didn't make it for that amount of flow. Here was another site. Um, there's a, a, a valley fill followed by a pond to capture some of the storm water and let things settle out. And then that led into um, a little stream channel below that was also completely blown out. It's off the mine permit boundary. It's become a huge self-consuming gully, a source of sediment, uh, et cetera. Um, so that, that was also restored. Restoring streams there means a little bit of valley restoration. Um, so um, part of this work is uh, working with these people, these contractors. And what was really interesting in these sites were, were the people we got to work with. So the guy driving the uh, big bulldozer with the shank on it, ripping up the soil on the mower tract in the Forest Service on the upper left there, uh, his name is uh, uh, Alan, I think, and Alan used to work hauling out coal from that same site. So that's kind of a neat thing. So now he's helping to restore it. The other folks there in those pictures, um, we hired uh, uh, an out-of-state company to do this big restoration project because it was, it was bigger than most of the in-state companies uh, could handle, and they were working on our other projects. Um, they had to find local help they hired local equipment operators. They were laid off coal miners, but they were good equipment operators. They had the skills, they worked hard, and this is what they do now. This is what they do. They're part of this crew. They go all over West Virginia in multiple states doing restoration work. Pretty neat story. So I was on the web yesterday, and uh, I came across these charts showing the um, value of the ecological restoration industry and also the, um, the number of jobs created and, and, be, and how high that is uh, because it's very labor intensive. So it's, it's kind of a, a neat picture to think about, especially in Southern West Virginia. These are areas that have been hemorrhaging jobs, hemorrhaging people, uh, and, and things are pretty rough down there. So it, it, uh, this isn't the topic of my, of my talk, but I wanted to include it because I think from a, a human and societal value down there, maybe there's some, some hope that restoration can, can uh, do important things there ecologically and economically too. Uh, just to sum up, these are some of the lessons we've learned from stream restoration. So these aren't all the impacts of coal mines, but um, we've learned about uh, the importance of restoring soils and forests and carbon sequestration on these sites, avoiding non-native plants, minimizing stream impacts on-site and off-site, um, decommissioning roads, um, really thinking about the resilience of these landscapes and how to restore that, and then finally, we're creating jobs. So that's all I have today, uh, and I'll look forward to the discussion that comes. Thank you. All right, good morning. I'm so glad to be with you today, but not as glad as I am when I'm on my river or in the woods. Um, this is my backyard river, the Elk. The Elk is our longest river with, that starts and ends within our state's borders. It's stressed by coal mining and natural gas production. Um, it's also infamous. It was the victim of a massive chemical leak that resulted in um, the largest scale 
chemical contamination drinking water crisis in our nation's history in January of 2014 in Charleston and the nine counties surrounding area. Um, last summer, epic flooding. That, dock, that flooding dock isn't there anymore. Um, but it's also that what you're seeing behind me is um, critical habitat for the diamond darter, one of the most rarest fish in the world. Only 20 of these have been identified, and they're all in the Elk River. So. Um, but I'm glad that what, you know, to hear what's coming together today is that we're, we're not able to separate environmental impacts from social aspects and economic aspects. And part of, you know, I'm, I've always loved the river, um, but actually it was more of the social justice concerns that drew me in. Um, I'll never forget, I was lobbying on another issue at the state capitol, and I heard a, a, a public hearing about um, the um, Horizontal Well Control Act. Um, I think it was about 2007, 2008, and a gentleman from Wetzel County got up, and he, and he, and he started talking about the impact of the, the shale gas boom in his community and, and on his farm. And he said, you know, I used to go out with my kids on summer nights and we'd stargaze and because of this well pad and the 24 seven light pollution, we can't see the stars anymore. And it just, you know, it took my breath away. It's like, you know, what, what's going on here? And I, I ended up going up to Wetzel County, saw what's going on about 10 years ago and it was amazing how rapidly it seems things like were changing for these rural communities and their way of life. So anyway, um, to think, you know, our challenge at West Virginia Rivers is to take the science and the work that many of you are doing in this room and explaining this in a, to policymakers and to the general public in a way they understand and a, in a way they can relate it to their everyday lives and how it impacts them personally. But what I'm here to highlight today, and I'm, I just want to kick off uh, with some background on um, how we got one aspect of our work that got into looking at how we minimize environmental impacts, particularly water, um, from shale gas development. And we did this by partnering uh, almost five years ago now with Trout Unlimited and the Appalachian Stewardship Foundation to create a um, volunteer-based citizen stream monitoring program. And what set our, our project apart is we, we started with the science and looked at data from, from organizations like the Nature Conservancy and a Conservation Success Index and looked at where, where are the priority areas in the state in terms of water and watersheds that are most vulnerable to shale gas development and perhaps environmental impact. So we did this mapping exercise. It gave us an idea of where the shale deposits are, um, their likelihood for development, and high priority watersheds. And partnering with Trout Unlimited, obviously we were looking at some of the cold water fisheries and, and the native um, um, and wild trout habitat. So that's how we started. And then shortly after, um, we started hearing about these huge pipeline projects. And it seemed like, you know, as drilling kind of came into a lull, the next phase was this infrastructure build out and the pipelines. And those red lines you see there were, were the early routes of the Atlantic Coast Pipeline and the Mountain Valley Pipeline. And it's like, you're, you're gonna do what? <laughs> you're gonna go through these, you know, high, high quality headwater streams and very rugged um, um, mountainous terrain. And that's when we, and unprecedented kind of um, in terms of length and size of these pipelines um, on this kind of landscape and, and these high quality watersheds. So we shifted our program a little bit and um, concentrated on training our volunteers to be able to collect baseline um, data on, on these pipeline routes and to prepare for um, construction and, and monitoring what's happening as, as those pipelines are construction, constructed in terms of impacts to, to the water quality. We did a little closer um, honing in of these routes and looked at where um, trout populations were. <laughs> And again, looked at prior what are the priority places we wanted to get that baseline data. So hopefully, we can detect problems early 
and minimize those environmental impacts. So just some um, successes of, of this project so far. Um, this is actually out of date. We've had a, a couple more trainings. We're at close to 30 trainings and over 400 volunteers trained um, and almost 400 sites that have been monitored in these priority areas. Here's our crew who was out in the Mon, the Mon National Forest last week. We had what we call the Mon Snapshot Day, where we um, sent teams out into those priority areas, collected um, around uh, data at uh, near 60 sites that day. What are some of the things that our volunteers are looking for? Um, in terms of pipeline, this was the Stonewall Gathering pipeline in the middle of the state. They had lots of problems. Here, here was one of them that's probably hard to see, but it's a pretty large landslide that was you know, dumping sediment um, into the stream below. Um, some of, you know, we're not, we're doing the, the in-stream sampling. We're also doing kind of this visual reconnaissance and um, training our volunteers to understand best management practices in terms of erosion and sediment control and what to look for in terms of making sure that those are doing their job and not failing. Um, and here's an example of when they do fail. Um, if you can, this, what this is is sediment flowing into, from one, tr one stream flowing into a clear stream. And this was from the Rover pipeline um, earlier this year which led into numerous water quality violations and, and finally DEP shutting them down temporarily um, to correct those. Because again, thing, those best management practices that were put forth um, were not working and were not meeting um, their requirements under the permit. And that's one thing I would put forth in terms of minimizing environmental impacts. We, we rely heavily on um, permits being effective. And the more specific we see permits are able to be and, and are implemented, um, the better. And here are some um, you know, aspects in terms of pipelines where we're promoting the idea of more specific, site-specific requirements, um, karst areas where you have the cave systems and you're getting into some tricky situations. Um, certainly with these pipelines going through our mountainous areas, we're talking about steep slopes and there are different soil types. Some are more highly erodible than others. Something to consider. Um, stream crossings. Every stream is different and its banks are different. Um, between the MVP and ACP, we're talking about 1,300, 1,300 stream crossings um, combined in West Virginia alone. They, they go into other states as well. That's a lot of crossings. That's a lot of water that at, at risk for some of this um, uh, sedimentation that you, you saw a picture of. Another thing that the water crisis in Charleston brought our attention to are source water protection areas. These are where you have a, a, um, either a groundwater recharge zone or you're in a certain proximity to a drinking water intake where we want to be extra careful. There was actually a, a pipeline um, right away and um, right over the border from Monroe County, um, the Selenese pipeline, where a, a diesel spill, and this was in the right of way where it was cleared, um, sunk into a sinkhole and ended up contaminated the drinking water supply for the town of Petersburg, West Virginia. And they were without, they had to ship in other water for two weeks um, while they dealt with that problem, which many of you know, groundwater can be, can be very complicated and very tricky. And there's a lot we don't know about how groundwater in our car systems um, travel. Critical habitat mentioned the, the, the trout um, work we're doing and others. And then this anti-degradation, um, Piece there in our in our state law, um, we have to assure that these projects do not degrade um, water to some degree, fifteen percent, and it, and it gets complicated because our our streams are classified differently. Um, but our our highest quality, the idea is that we're keeping our clean water clean, and our highest quality streams, uh, we don't want to see any. Um, degradation of those streams, um, and that is that is our law, and that is why the currently the West Virginia Department of Environmental Protection um, t uh, withdrew their um, state permit or their 401 water quality certification for the Mountain Valley Pipeline um, to to conduct a more thorough review around the anti degradation standard. 
So I'm just going to give you one example of, of what we're currently looking at. Um, we had the opportunity to take DEP personnel on a, on a tour of the proposed ACP route. And this is in Pocahontas County. I know the map doesn't um, show you much other than, but if I bring your attention to the red line and then the <laughs> light green shading, that light green shading is karst topography. So this pipeline is, is going through, right through, this is one example. There are many others along on the hundred, several hundred mile route. Um, this is where it crosses Big Springs, which is a um, trout stream. And um, they're proposing to blast through this area. And that's something we wanted to bring to DEP's attention, that blasting through karst can cause some problem, perhaps unanticipated problems. So here's one place where we're looking for some, some more site-specific um, conditions. Another example, this is Clover, Clover Creek, um, also in Pocahontas County, also a karst area. And the pipeline, the ACP is slated to come off of this mountain into um, this valley, and that's upstream and here's downstream. It'll, it, it's set to cross right downstream. And this pool here, and this was like great timing. The trout were listening or something. <laughs> because we walked up on this low water bridge with DEP folks. And there was, this is an undocumented trout stream. We walk up there. There's a bunch of trout. Like, OK, you guys can't deny this is not a trout stream. So they sent DNR out there. They did electrofishing. They did a survey there. And lo and behold, a lot of um, native, native trout. And it was this pool is like a nursery, trout nursery. So again, um, there's so much we don't know <laughs> about our rivers and streams. We have 40,000 miles of them. Um, and these projects, I mean, they take a lot of time and information gathering to get it right. Um, you may have heard that uh, a week ago, less than Friday night, last Friday night at 710, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission um, certified both the Atlantic Coast Pipeline and the Mountain Valley Pipeline in a non-public meeting. Um, but there was a dissension, and this is Cheryl LaFleur. She is the chair of FERC, and um, she dissented. Two, the recent two Trump appointees voted yes, and she voted no. And what she cited, I think, is very instructive for the topic of, of this panel, is that she questioned approving both of these pipelines because they were so similar in terms of the proximity of their routes, the cumulative impact because they were in, in, the, in the same region and affecting um, the same watersheds, and the timing that the construction is likely to happen simultaneously. So that kind of compounds the issue around um, cumulative impacts in, in terms of the risk that construction poses. She, the FERC also instructed their staff to look at alternatives. That's part of their charge. And they did this um, research around this merge systems alternative and found that, yes, there is an alternative, it would, and it would indeed serve the capacity of both projects. Um, the merge systems alternative would have increased co-location. So I think that's an important piece to, to take away from this, is are there ways when we're looking at infrastructure or, and, and pipelines, can we co-locate them with existing right-of-ways versus disturbing new land and new, and new watershed? Um, the alternative would have avoided national forest and would have reduced the number of crossings on the um, Appalachian Trail, Blue Ridge Parkway, it would have reduced the amount of construction in karst, and also would have reduced the total project length in terms of 173 miles, of course, reducing land disturbance and impact on, on uh, streams. The other thing, and, and I'll, I'll just say that the reason, um, <laughs> it's like, why didn't that happen? <laughs> um, the companies um, made a strong argument that to go to a, an alternative would have delayed the project significantly. So um, that, that was the justification for going ahead uh, um, with both projects from the other two FERC commissioners. Now what, thank you, um, what uh, uh, Chairwoman LaFleur also um, challenged FERC and it's in her dissenting opinion was that 
brought it up this question of need, and I, I believe FERC will probably get a legal, legal challenge on this, is, is there demand, is there need for, for both of these projects? And she said, when you take the, when you consider the aggregate environmental impacts, and when you consider these environmentally superior alternatives, that need needs to be discussed. And she felt like um, the, the topic of need was underrepresenting in, in this deliberation around these pipelines. Um, so, this is my, my last slide that, um, you know, kind of shows the reality we're living in and um, West Virginia being so um, dependent on um, fossil fuel extraction in terms of our economy. Um, we are an energy producing state. It comes at a cost. Um, we also have great pride in the scenic beauty of our state um, and the people who who live here, who want to see their kids um, want to stay. And so, um, you know, it's interesting. I think we're at a, at a really interesting point in our state's history of talking about things like um, drinking water security and economic development and taking advantage of the scenic beauty and um, natural amenities that the state has in terms of tourism, visitation, and other things. Um, but we also, you know, are, I think, you know, from my perspective and spending a lot of time at the state capitol, you know, something I haven't touched on, but I think is a serious issue when we look at the, the drill fracking and, and the pipelines being built and the, the storage hub, we're talking about a lot more drilling, we're talking about a lot more waste toxic waste. And I have seen no, in terms of our policy makers, no thought to long-term planning of how to deal with the volume of waste <laughs> that we're talking about producing. Where is it going to go? And right now it's going into our, our commercial landfills. Um, we're, we're, we're watching Antero, who's building a nearly 500 acre um, landfill uh, for byproducts from wastewater recycling. Um, a whole new technology coming to West Virginia and, and um, first of its kind. So a lot to think about here. I look forward to the further discussion. Thanks for your attention. I get it till it gets there. Oh, never mind. Okay. Yeah, I don't need to, they don't need to know. No? Oh, yeah. Okay. Perfect. I <laughs> think. Good morning. Uh, I'm Susan Legro. I'm the executive director of an organization called the Center for Responsible Shale Development. It's a nonprofit that's based in Pittsburgh. Uh, and the purpose of the organization uh, was to bring together the diverse points of view from the environmental community and uh, the gas extraction industry to find ways of, uh, that they could work together toward um, a, better, uh, a better standard for operations by shale gas producers. Uh, I'm very pleased to be up here uh, on a panel with people like Todd and Angie, who are uh, who, who individually and with their organizations uh, represent the best of civil society in terms of trying to uh, be a voice for what is best for all of us. Uh, 
Uh, and what I want to talk about today um, is another uh, attempt uh, at, a, at a, the best of civil society, and particularly the role of voluntary standards, voluntary industry standards, and third-party certification to achieve many of those goals. Um, as I indicated, the mission of our organization is to bring together these diverse points of view to ensure that where shale gas development takes place, it is done to the highest environmental and community standards. You'll note that we do not take a political position. As a nonprofit, we don't lobby or advocate um, specific legislative or regulatory positions other than those that are uh, intended to advance the common welfare. Uh, we, uh, the, the genesis of the organization came out of the very early shale gas boom, particularly in Pennsylvania. A gentleman named John Hanger, who uh, was at one point the secretary of the Department of Environmental Protection in Pennsylvania, was uh, in that seat at the time when um, the controversy over the water quality in Dimmick, Pennsylvania, hit the public news waves. And I'm sure many of you remember the issues about the flaming water, uh, the, the water coming out of the, the kitchen tap that uh, could be set afire. Um, and having seen and lived with these experiences of dramatically different points of view about what the problem was and what needed to be done, upon leaving his office, he participated, he brought together the, the initial group of companies and environmentalists and other uh, civic leaders to say, let's, aren't there areas where we can find agreement? Uh, and let's try to do that. And it is, uh, and, and the, the organization that we have now is um, small, but I think it's significant. Uh, we have some very large um, uh, extraction and production companies operating in the Appalachian Basin, and the scope of our activities includes the, the Appalachian Basin. Um, so obviously we have a couple of uh, uh, international companies, Chevron and Shell, as, where, as well as some very significant regional players, um, uh, EQT and Consol, and with EQT's purchase of the rice energy assets, EQT will become uh, the owner of the, the largest number of extraction wells in the Appalachian Basin. Um, we also have some significant environmental groups, um, the Environmental Defense Fund, which works internationally along with the Clean Air Task Force and the Pennsylvania Environmental Council. And we try to work regularly with other um, environmental and industry groups as well. We've worked with the Nature Conservancy, Resources for the Future, um, and, and uh, other uh, shale gas producers to try to identify what needs to be done and how do we go forward. Um, I'm going, uh, the slides that I have are probably more than we can go through, uh, but I wanted you to have them for future reference if, you, if you're interested in pursuing this conversation. Um, but I think the important thing here is uh, when you think about what this organization tr tries to achieve, um, it, our view is that the best interest of society as a whole is enhanced by collaboration. I think that's really important in today's uh, world where there are so many strongly held points of view um, and less and less tolerance for individuals who have a different point of view. Uh, but we really think that society is bettered uh, by um, the, the willingness to work together and collaborate. Um, I think we also are guided by the notion that um, industry needs to demonstrate leadership uh, by practicing the highest level of environmental responsibility. And it is the role of environmentalists and the community at large to insist that that level of responsibility to be met. So um, the, the, the charge to groups uh, like Andy's and Todd's is to, is to point out the need and insist that the, the industry community live up to the standards required. Uh, and just to give you an example of uh, the 
the attempt to balance the inputs into this organization. We have a, a balanced board that includes leaders of industry, leaders of the environmental um, community, and also some individuals who have manifested a commitment to environmental issues but are not necessarily aligned with either. So we have individuals from academia, we have a toxicologist um, who has spent his life in public health, um, and various civic leaders who uh, understand government and um, collaboration. The organization is built on uh, other organizations that have shown that adoption of voluntary industry standards can lead to a higher level of performance. Uh, when, this, when the Center for Responsible Shale Development was founded, again, back in um, late part of uh, 2008 uh, and 2000, going up to 2011, most state regulatory formats were geared toward conventional drilling and were woefully out of date when you started talking about the issues that were presented by unconventional drilling. So one of the goals in setting up this organization, particularly for the environmental participants, was to identify a template of, of standards that could be used by states who were involved in the activity of trying to raise their standards. What ought your state regulatory programs look like if you were aiming toward the highest standards? I would say one of the, uh, the motivators for the industry participants was an acknowledgement that the state regulations were behind the ball in terms of uh, addressing the issues associated with uh, shale gas development and the need to build some confidence that there, there were ways that industry could go forward and, and regulate itself in some ways by adopting a much more stringent set of standards and then living up to them. So again, uh, modeling on some of the other initiatives, particularly the Forest Stewardship Council, and then other things like uh, the Green Building Initiative and the Marine Stewardship Council, um, this group adopted a, a template of 15 standards intended to address issues relating to water um, and air and climate. Those seem to be the, the primary drivers at that point in time. I think as time has gone on, we are currently in a status where we recognize that there are other issues that need to be addressed and that some of those issues are not necessarily ones that can or perhaps even should be addressed by legislation and regulation but are best addressed by civil society. Some of those issues, I would say, are uh, ones like planning and siting of facilities. It's very, very difficult for states to come up with a, a uniform, comprehensive kind of land use development plan for oil and gas, um, and, they, and they fear what could happen if they did that just for one industry. So recognizing the complexity of that, that issue probably exceeds the ability of regulation other than perhaps you could get some very basic baseline kinds of regulations. But here again, uh, there are many areas where by pooling information, the environmental community and the um, industries can come up with a, a toolbox of actions that can be taken that would avoid, minimize, and mitigate the impacts of, uh, of development, and particularly when you start talking about the cumulative impacts that An Angie was mentioning. And that is a perfect area for that kind of discourse and collaboration to take place, free from the, uh, uh, the, the, the high-pitched decibels that surround so many issues when you talk about gas development. Um, Basically, the model is one of continuous improvement. Identify what needs to be done, look at the science, convene the stakeholders, um, come up with a, a best practice that we, we publish. Um, and then, um, I think most importantly, and somewhat uniquely for this organization, we run a certification program. Uh, it is a voluntary program. Any 
any operator in the Appalachian Basin can apply for certification, but they must be able to demonstrate to our independent third-party auditors that they meet across the basin at all their operations the 15 performance standards that have been set forth. This is not an easy bar. Uh, and we have had many companies that we've talked with, particularly smaller ones, who have expressed the concern that it is not an easy bar and that it is an all or nothing kind of bar. And in fact, they've advocated some kind of um, structure more akin to what the lead and green building structure is where you have levels of performance. Um, and that is obviously something that we intend to be looking into. Um, but it's very interesting because, again, many of the folks who have been involved in this initiative from the outset have said, no, uh, the idea of standards is you're going to perform better than with the minimal requirements of state law, uh, but, uh, and, and therefore we ought not water them down in any way. I'm also happy to say that at this time, most state regulations have actually been enhanced and improved to deal with uh, shale gas development so that as it now stands, certain of our standards are more stringent um, than, and continue to be more stringent than what states require. Uh, but at the same time, uh, many uh, state standards are at least as stringent as, as what our, their, their regulatory requirements are very similar to what we have um, promulgated as voluntary standards. Uh, just to give you an idea, I won't go through these individually, but to give you an idea of the, the standards we're talking about, um, this is the initial suite of uh, water standards that were adopted. And so you'll see that since 2013, we have required that uh, there be zero discharge of treated of wastewater, um, although we have a, a, not too long ago adopted a wastewater standard that would allow treatment uh, but only at facilities that perform the highest level of, um, uh, of treatment um, for, uh, that, that essentially meets the best available technology. Um, we require water recycling, uh, no pits on, on well pads, uh, but double lined impoundments. And so, as I say, we've been requiring this since 2013 and the companies that have been certified can meet these standards at every one of their facilities across the basin. Um, from the air standpoint, uh, we have required uh, a number of actions of existing facilities that are contained in the federal new source performance standards and would apply only to new facilities. But we require, again, that for certain types of compressor engines, et cetera, that, um, and certainly for completions, that the requirements of the new source performance standards be met, again, across the basin. Now you might say, well, why would people participate in this? Um, and uh, I, I think there are a number of reasons. Uh, certainly for the environmental community, um, it, it's, it's a seat at the table. Uh, now again, the, the environmental groups that have chosen to, per, to work with us have faced a great deal of criticism um, for uh, essentially consorting with the enemy, I, I think in some people's view. Uh, but they have brought, um, again, this insistence on the highest level of performance um, and, and a rigorous, uh, I guess, cross-examination of the industry of why can't you do that? Don't you have this data? Why can't we do that? Can we find a way to do that? Uh, and that's a tremendously important process to, uh, to engage in. For the operators, again, I think it is a recognition by those who have a long-term view that we're going to be involved in this industry for a long period of time and we all must coexist, uh, that uh, it is important on a continuous basis to be evaluating how they are performing and what can be done to perform at a higher level. Uh, and this has become particularly evident in, in issues uh, dealing with communities. Um, the operators we've worked with have all told me, and many that we haven't worked with, um, have told me that uh, the vast majority of their time is spent dealing with community issues. Um, and perhaps that's right, rightly so, because um, these are, are so, um, 
so imminent for, for the people who are affected. And it's absolutely important if this industry is going to proceed in, in any, at any level that it accommodate the interests of the communities. Um, I, I want to point out, too, uh, for those of you who are interested, that there are a number of resources available if you are interested in learning about what are the best approaches to manage and mitigate the emissions and the impacts associated with shale gas development. Um, obviously, a, a significant issue at this time is uh, the impact of pipelines. And in fact, I would say the public attention has shifted from uh, concerns about casings, et cetera, um, with the extraction and production industry to the impact of the pipelines. Um, and so uh, there are a couple groups, the Natural Gas Supply Collaborative and the Downstream Natural Gas Initiative that um, have come together. Th these are primarily um, purchasers of natural gas, um, merchant power plants and power companies <coughs> power distribution companies that are looking at the value chain from starting with operation and production all the way down to the consumer to say, you know, we need to address this as a holistic issue um, and make sure that at each step uh, we are managing um, the uh, environmental uh, impacts and consequences appropriately. And I, th I think this is a great step. Um, I, I do think this is perhaps overdue. I, I also want to point out that in 20, early 2016, um, the governor of Pennsylvania, Tom Wolf, convened a task group to work on what are we going to do about pipelines. Uh, and he put together a task force of about 48 people, uh, people from across the spectrum, um, including public, I, I suspect someone from the Nature Conservancy was on that task force. Do you know, Thomas? Yeah, uh, people from each of the environmental groups involved with us, as well as um, uh, people from industry. Uh, they had something like 100 volunteers who helped amass the data and the information, and they came up with 184 recommendations, um, some for government, actions that government needed to do, um, some for civil society, some for industry, et cetera. Um, but they, that serves as a real reference, I think, for the kinds of issues that, um, the kind and the approaches that would be valuable in terms of dealing with infrastructure development. Most of these have not been uh, acted upon, sadly. Um, if you know anything about Pennsylvania politics, uh, you, you know the explanation for that. Um, a, a couple of different approaches, too, that I, I would recommend that folks look into. One um, is the state review of oil and natural gas environmental regulations, uh, an, an, an organization called Stronger. Um, basically, this is made up of state environmental reg and pipeline regulatory agencies, and it is a, a compendium of how different states across the country who are dealing with oil and gas issues are, um, are regulating um, different kinds of issues. And that, so again, it's a tremendous reference point for anyone who is looking to say, what are the best practices? How can we, how can we implement them? Who's doing what? Um, and then finally, the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board, SASB. I don't think it's well known uh, in, in our area, but it, it's based in um, California. Um, and has quite a, a broad reach. They have um, adopted sustainability standards for, I think, 93 industries, and they have some standards that are specifically geared to um, uh, oil and gas production and extraction, as well as to pipelines and distribution. Um, and, and they are quite comprehensive um, and, and tremendously informative. Um, so this kind of um, voluntary collaborative approach has been, uh, ident has been um, identified and complemented in a number of different forums. Uh, certainly the National Governors Association, uh, and I, I want to point out the um, Investor Environmental Health Network, uh, which works with some in the investment community and 
puts out an annual ranking of extraction and production companies in which they evaluate their practices and their transparency and disclosure uh, on various other uh, criteria and ranks them as, and, and then provides an explanation for their ranking. So I think that's very valuable to communities and to landowners, et cetera, in terms of who's doing well, who's not doing so well, what do we need to ask of them? Um, and then finally, the, uh, I would say the Boston Consulting Group and, and the Harvard University uh, conducted a study about two years ago, um, essentially identifying the, um, the, the shale gas as a, a, a sort of a, a golden egg for the United States economy if it can be done properly. And that was the significant caveat <laughs> on their findings that can it be done in a responsible way and in fact, it must be done in a responsible way if it is going to uh, yield the promise that it holds. Um, and one of the things they did, unbeknownst to our organization, is they examined each of our 15 standards and what it cost a company to, uh, on a per site basis, to uh, raise their standard from what the state regulations required to what we required. And they found that although it could be, it, it could be up to, depending on the level that the facility was at, it could be up to $400,000 um, for a well. However, when you compare that to the, the value that was going to be uh, received from that well's production over its lifetime, it is a minimal, minimal fraction of, of the value of that well. Um, and so we got an endorsement from them that, that, hey, this is a good way to proceed. So in any event, I think this, uh, particularly in the times we're living in, it's, it's critically important for um, folks to listen to others and to find ways to collaborate and to continue to work to go forward on what and whatever kinds of issues we see need need to be addressed. Obviously, we've identified some of them: midstream um, uh, construction, um, cumulative impacts, siting and planning. But there will be more, and uh, I think that's one of the strengths of our our society is. Um, Individual activism and collective activism can yield results. Thank you. Uh, well, thanks to all of our speakers, and we'll have um, s uh, some cards coming around if you have questions that can uh, be brought up here, and I'll share them. Uh, while those are going around and being collected, uh, I have a hopefully relatively quick question for uh, each of our panelists. So I'll start with uh, Todd. Uh, you mentioned a couple of things that I'd like you to see if you could briefly explain. First, you talked about mitigation banking credits and, and what that means. And I was wondering if you could kind of briefly describe that for us. Uh, I know brief on that might not be so easy. Uh, and also, if you could talk a little bit about how many sites we're talking about that you'd like to be able to do and, and what it would cost to, to do everything you'd like to do. Golly. <laughs> Um, okay, so mitigation banking, um, that'll, that'll take us through the lunch hour, but um, <laughs> I'll, I'll try to make it quick. Um, so under the Clean Water Act and rules that came out in 2008, um, uh, companies, developers who have impacts on streams and wetlands are supposed to first avoid impacts, second minimize impacts, third mitigate for their impacts. And so there's a hierarchy for how impacts are supposed to be mitigated. Uh, the first is through mitigation banks, which are private entities that take private capital and restore streams and wetlands, and then sell credits uh, to uh, other entities that have impacts that through the permitting process need to mitigate for their impacts. So this is the preferred method of uh, mitigation because essentially the restoration happens and credits are released before the impacts. So there's no um, time lag there between uh, impact and mitigation. Um, so a mitigation bank is a private entity that invests private capital uh, to do restoration and, and then sell credits to, um, to entities that have impacts that they need to offset through the permitting process. And there, there's many steps, it's uh, uh, regulated 
uh, regulatory oversight, uh, et cetera. Your second question, uh, I don't, boy, I, I wouldn't even know how to answer that. There is, uh, we work on many different kinds of stream restoration. Some of it's for brook trout habitat with DNR. Some of it's for sediment load reductions with DEP. Some of it's mitigation. Um, there are, uh, the, the, there's, there's a long future of work in, in all of those. Um, I know, and I, I would say it's a, it's a growing industry and will probably keep growing with all of these impacts we're talking about today as well as the Rose Bill that just passed, um, et cetera. Uh, all the consulting firms I know are, are hiring people who do this work and can't find enough of them and are turning down work in the meantime. So um, uh, I, I don't know how to answer uh, what, what we could do, uh, how much of it we could do, or, or what I'd want to do, but I, it'd be fun to keep doing. <laughs> Very good. Um, well, we have a lot of questions. I will try to get to them. Some of them are, are similar, and, and including the question I was going to ask Angie is uh, on at least one of the cards, so that's uh, synergies are good. Um, you talked about enforcement uh, and using permitting as part of that process, and one of the things I've seen in my research is um, we talk about passing new laws and increasing regulation, but if we're not enforcing existing ones, that doesn't mean a whole lot. And so I'm curious if you could talk a little bit more about maybe places that were coming up short, or things that you've seen in enforcement, or uh, maybe uh, expand a little bit on the specificity that you mentioned that, that helps increase uh, your ability to, to provide oversight. That's right. Um, you know, laws are only as strong as they are enforced. Um, and uh, it's been challenging. I, I mean, we've been a part, other groups have been a part of, of citizen uh, lawsuits under the Clean Water Act because the state has failed to enforce the law. Um, and it's a resource question, too. Uh, I was told about a month ago when it looked like the writing was on the wall with these big pipelines. And these two pipelines are one of hundreds. <laughs> these are big ones, but we have, we have around 1,000 gathering line projects that have happened over the last year and a half. Um, that our state DEP has a half dozen, six inspectors looking at pipeline um, construction activities. So the idea of these major projects getting started soon and not just having a handful of inspectors out there um, calls to my, our responsibility to mobilize um, what I described, our kind of citizen monitoring, because the regulators aren't out there. And um, Rover and Stonewall Jackson, those were citizen reports. And that's why um, I think Organizations like ours are important to publicize what is happening and the response. And some of the frustration is, is when companies are given a notice of violation or consent decree and the, the penalties are so low that it's not really a deterrent. And there are some good companies wanting to do the right thing, and there are some companies with really, really bad track records that, for whatever reason, are still allowed to operate in this state. Thank you. Uh, so, Susan, there's uh, more than a few questions. Uh, curious about kind of where your funding comes from, how things are designed, and, and where your standards match up with, for example, uh, compared to federal methane proposals and uh, and those kinds of things. Um, in addition to that, one thing I'd like to, to ask that's kind of a little more specific is that you focus on a particular region um, in this area. So, like, for example, the 90% um, water recycling um, target. Um, that obviously wouldn't work in a place, well, it, it would not likely to be met by any company in Oklahoma, for example. So the standards don't translate, uh, at least immediately. And so I'm curious if you talk a little bit about um, how specific those are to this region and, and if there's a plan to, if anyone's going to look to yeah. make those across the board. Yeah. Uh, well, I think your first question was about funding. Um, we are funded actually by the, the participants, the environmental organizations and the companies. When the organization was set up, I, I, there was a great concern that although the companies should pay for <laughs> uh, some of this, that it, we, we did not want 
there to be any um, appearance that it was controlled uh, in any way by the companies. And hence, you see the, the board, and you, you have a requirement that any of our standards that are adopted have to be adapted unanimously by that board of 12 people, you know, most of whom are not affiliated with industry. Um, we also get funding from the uh, foundation foundations uh, for various programs that we initiate. Um, I, your other question related to the varying standards across. Oh, different how, yes. Uh, the original intent was to address issues unique to the uh, Appalachian Basin. So obviously we have a lot of water resources and so um, we recognize that in some areas like Oklahoma that you mentioned that uh, certain of our standards wouldn't apply. Um, you know, we have a no flaring requirement and in North Dakota they're flaring away. Um, but uh, some of our standards were meant to to recognize one, what is possible here and two, um, what the society here would require. I mean, what might be acceptable in Oklahoma or North Dakota is not acceptable uh, to many people in this region. Um, our intent really was, and our hope, uh, was that other regions would, would adopt a similar model and come up with standards that are uniquely applicable to them. Now, having said that, certain of our standards certainly could be adopted anywhere. Um, it, you know, for instance, as I say, recycling might not work everywhere, but you know, no idling, um, certain types of, particularly the air standards, uh, certain types of compressors, um, they can be used, they could be used anywhere if there is a will to do it. Um, Angie, uh, there's a question, you, you talked about the wastewater recycling plant that's coming in. The, the question is what impacts that will have on mitigating harmful effects of, of shale gas development and, and will the plant itself have uh, potential impacts on the environment? So I, I would answer that saying there's a lot of unknowns. Um, we have not seen a plant of this scale in our region to date. And um, right now they're permitted to, once they treat the wastewater, to discharge that into surface water, a receiving stream. Um, something we did as this project developed and went through the permitting processes, insist on, on monitoring. And we're still not happy. <laughs> so, um, we've appealed that um, permit because there's, there, there, the monitoring requirements aren't as comprehensive as we think they need to be to be from a precautionary standpoint and just knowing um, what we know in terms of um, what kind of pollutants could be involved in, in this, this, this wastewater. Um, so it's something we're watching closely because it is so new and um, there is going, let me just tell you the scale of this. The company says there will be 600 truckloads per day seven days a week going in and out of this facility with waste. 600 per day, every day. So we're not just, I mean, we're not just talking about the facility, we're also talking about traffic, talking about emissions. Um, we like the idea of recycling wastewater, um, but the sludge that will be a byproduct of this um, is radioactive, and they're saying now it's going to be trained out to Utah. Um, but, uh, the byproduct of the salts are still going to be landfilled at, at this facility. Uh, I'm going to try and combine a couple of these. Uh, for Todd, it, one of the questions is why are the coal companies allowed to leave their sites in such bad shape? Uh, and and in, in combination to that, uh, I'd, like, I'd like you to answer that and fix it for us. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> and, and is there any effort uh, moving forward with, with mining timber and other operations to try and prevent this impact so that we don't keep causing the same problems and, and learn from our mistakes. Yeah, so um, those, those are good questions, and my expertise is limited to trying to fix a few things where I can. Um, I, you know, I think generally the, the coal mine reclamation has improved over the years. If you look at the, 
the, the site in my, the middle of my talk with all the gullies and stuff. Um, that was that was before the the big surface mining reclamation act was passed in the uh, seventy seven or whenever that was, um, and so uh, you compare that with the impacts of the modern uh, mountaintop mine, which are which are different, but um, the on site impacts. Uh, well, I don't know. It's hard to compare because the scale of of landscape movement. Um, has changed, but um, the way they left the site was certainly more stable. Um, it would be a huge leap forward to, to also try to control and limit off-site impacts. I don't know why that boundary is what it is. Um, it's pretty crazy. So that, the, the mountaintop mine site we worked at, they're in the process of releasing their, their bonds and, and reclaiming the area. Um, we've seen water quality improvements as that process has, has happened. Um, a lot of those roads and ditches will be reclaimed up on the mountaintop, which will improve life where we are down in the valley below. Um, um, so th those are good things. There are, there are many other impacts that are going to linger, including water quality, which we haven't really talked about. Um, but uh, what was the second part of your question, Joe? Uh, just how we can do better moving forward. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, when we reclaim those sites, are we thinking about the way that the way that landscape and those soils and those forests should be? That's that would put them back into our our landscape uh, and and contribute to it, its resilience again. Are we thinking about how they produce clean water? Um, uh, there's 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 a million ways to, to still improve that from, from an ecological standpoint, certainly. Well, we are uh, out of time, I'm afraid, and try and keep us and get us back on schedule. So uh, sorry to those who I didn't get to your questions. There, there are some other good ones. Um, but uh, it's time to move on and, and thank our panelists for their presentations and their time. <laughs>so lunch will be in our in our event space if you go out to the main hallway to the lobby take a take a right and it's the very first large room on the right so we'll have lunch and our two lunchtime speakers um, immediately following lunch thank you <laughs>